Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani, the Total Connector. Really excited, looking forward to my next uh, special guest, uh, Stephen Cole. He's, um, as he calls himself, an advocate capitalist, angel investor, and a true Bitcoiner. He's not only, you know, one of those investors that just looks for return on investment, but he has got, you know, principles, ethos, vision when it comes to, you know, to, to, to the future of, of all of us, humanity. Uh, prosperity, you know, and uh, our civilization and the, and the freedom from these, uh, you know, uh, criminal centralized entities such as nation states, governments and central banks. So I want to, you know, uh, uh, pick his brains and um, um, and hear his thoughts and his perspective, his vision on where we, how we can uh, accelerate this, this critical adoption rate, uh, also called mass adoption, how we can, you know, more efficiently educate uh, what's his you know uh, his view of the things right now that are ongoing these crazy processes that are taking place uh, whether it's geopolitically macroeconomically what have you so without further ado this is my talk with Stephen Cole hope you're gonna enjoy this please give me a feedback uh, share retweet whatever you do it would uh, and follow me on Twitter please thank you so much and here you go Stephen Cole, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for coming, Marcelo. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, Stephen, I've um, um, been following you for quite some time. Um, I really enjoyed also the, I, I watched the interview or listened to the interview. I don't know which podcast it was, um, but it was just recently. And there you, in that, in that, in that episode, you somehow um, explained a little bit yourself uh, about your background, you know, because uh, I see you, you know, as an, a serial entrepreneur, investor, angel investor. It's really fascinating that you, um, you know, invested into all these uh, wonderful uh, Bitcoin projects, which help, you know, eventually, um, uh, to, you know, in the process of critical adoption rate. Uh, would it be the Samurai Wallet, Swan Bitcoin? Um, did I miss any? Uh, a couple others in the Bitcoin space, uh, Casa, and then uh, more recently, um, Satoshi Energy. And then I've done some investments that are outside of the Bitcoin realm as well. Wonderful. Uh, Stephen, could you just yeah, briefly maybe give a little bit of background for my listeners who might not you know, have heard of you? Yeah, sure. And that podcast may have been Gary Leland's podcast, yeah, right? the Crypto Cousins. Yeah, that was a pretty recent one. Um, Gary's a great, great guy. Uh, sure. So happy to go into a little bit of my background. You kind of summarized the investment side really well. So that has been my primary focus for the last couple of years is startup investing. And most of that startup investing is centered around uh, uh, the Bitcoin space, companies building on or around Bitcoin. Um, prior to that, I was uh, in the web engineering space. So I started my career a little over 10 years ago as an engineer at eBay. Worked there for a while and then at a couple of small startups leading and managing software teams. So primarily focused on internet infrastructure, networking servers, DevOps, um, all that. In the process, especially of joining the startups, I got to just see more about what makes companies tick. And especially at companies that size, interaction with the board and investors gave me an appreciation for that whole world of you know, how capital flows into companies and what, uh, you know, how good for the company it can be if you get investors who are aligned in certain ways and believe what you believe um, and are on board with the vision. So that just got me intrigued and I wanted to learn more about that world. Uh, both the startups I was at got acquired. Um, the, so I was at a cloud computing startup that was acquired by a larger enterprise EMC and then an artificial intelligence deep learning startup that was acquired by Intel. And so kind of rode a couple waves of really, really tiny company. And suddenly you're like at this big Leviathan of an organization. Um, and that whole journey was taught me a lot of things and the second acquisition gave me a little bit of capital to start investing in startups and just in bitcoin directly and that's become my passion and my focus since then although i would very much say that i'm i consider myself a bitcoiner first and a startup investor second any edge that i do have in investing 
doesn't come from any finance pedigree or particular expertise in the realm of investing itself. I think the edge, if any, comes from understanding why Bitcoin matters and having a vision for how I think Bitcoin is going to change the future that not many other people share and just trying to trying to invest around that and help find entrepreneurs who are aligned with that and help bring that to life. I mean, I've never actually, to be clear too, I, uh, I admire entrepreneurship, but I've never actually founded a company of my own in that sense. I've been a member of startups that were pretty tiny, you know, 10 or so employees um, in Silicon Valley. And so got a feel for what that's like kind of secondhand, but, um, but haven't actually founded a startup myself. Stephen, when you when you're offered projects or when you look into projects or uh, you know uh, for you know, investment purposes, um, like how do you how do you assess how do you evaluate what what, do you, what criteria do you look at? I mean, uh, like this, uh, uh, like in, in terms of what kind of value does it deliver to the to the you know to the user to the uh, you know to the customer? Uh, is it scalable? Do you look at the management? Are they trustworthy? You know, all these like different criteria. What are you looking at? Yeah, there are a ton of different factors that uh, that an investor can consider. I invest pretty early stage, so ideally pre-seed when the company is very early. And at that point, it tends to be a lot more about ideas and the mission and the vision and far less about the financials or like, like analyzing spreadsheets of run rate and, and income. So I like that. I think that plays more to my strengths, too, and is and is a lot more fun for me, frankly. Um, so I really look for companies that are ideologically aligned. And I think that simplifies so much, right? Because you, if you, as an entrepreneur, get an investor who believes in the why behind what you're doing and the, the different future that you want to see, then all of the rest just becomes implementation details. All of the rest, and, and all the rest will change. You know, inevitably, startups are really hard and you have to make hard strategic decisions and trade-offs. Um, and sometimes a plan that you have initially uh, has to get thrown out the window and you have to kind of do things differently. But hopefully you're only changing how you're doing it. You're not really changing why you're doing what you're doing or that end that you're ultimately trying to achieve. And so I think if you can get investors and entrepreneurs and teams all aligned around the mission, then it just simplifies so much. You know, there's, there's no stress about the details. You can just kind of analyze objectively. Yes, this makes sense. And now this is the best way to achieve that thing that we're all still on the same page about achieving. Mm -hmm. And what kind of questions would you, I mean, do you, you normally ask them like when you, when you think, when I think about Samurai, I'm a huge fan you know, of all the projects you've, you've been invested in, would it be Samurai Casa, uh, which I'm, you know, myself, a, a user <laughs> of all these products, uh, or, or at least ha uh, had been, uh, uh, for example, I turned my Casa 2 into my node because, you know, because I thought that's the next, next stage, you know, uh, yeah. but what do you, um, like, um, what kind of vision do you have when, when you go into these projects? I mean, do you see, do you foresee like, uh, okay, is it, is it practical? Is it usable? Can, can the average user use it? You know, this is where, where I'm like more, most concerned about. Yeah. Uh, that's certainly one like usability. And I think it's easier to relate to that usability when it is a, a B2C company, like a business to a consumer, um, because then you can really put yourself in the shoes of the person who would be using it and kind of envision what that user experience is like. Um, with, I, I'd say in general, I believe that Bitcoin is going to be the world's new money, like the new global base money for the world. I think it's, it, it's going to displace the dollar. And a lot of people throw that around, you know, hyperbolically. And I think it's easy to get Twitter engagement if you just say, oh, Bitcoin is going to destroy the dollar tomorrow. But in my very rational, you know, logical mind, I believe that Bitcoin is going to destroy the dollar effectively. Um, and hopefully that process is not violent and dystopian and dark. Hopefully it's a smooth upgrade um, with kind of various parts of society opting into that. Uh, that's what I hope for and what I would love to build for. Um, but companies that are helping prepare individuals for that future is the area that I love the most. And 
Samurai was a great example of that. So Samurai was my first investment within the realm of Bitcoin in terms of startup investments. Uh, that was actually pretty early on. I was the first outside investor back in late 2016. And at the time, a lot of the community was very divided around the block size debate. And that was obviously important to resolve and take care of. And I'm glad that it played out the way that it did. But I worried that privacy and fungibility were so important and those were kind of taking a back seat due to all the the drama around the block size debate and so when i saw samurai and what they were doing and just focused on on that and you know making sure that individuals have more control over their privacy and their financial sovereignty then that resonated with me and uh, and at that point it's you know if you can find a company that's aligned in that way then that makes the the decision a lot easier i also love when when the when the company maybe has a contrarian vision uh, that isn't shared by by many others and at some point if your vision is contrarian enough um maybe even in its early stages then it's it can be the difference between life and death. And I'm not necessarily saying that like this is the case in any of the investments that I've been involved in. But, um, you know, if you look more broadly at startup investing, like there are certainly cases where if some investor hadn't been willing to, to make this contrarian bet on this company, then that capital just may not have allowed that idea to be tried at all. And so I, you know, I have only been an angel investor for a few years. And so I'm not deploying the amounts of capital like a Jason Calacanis or, you know, some of these super experienced investors are. But I think for that reason, I get even more excited about just trying to find these bets that not many other investors are paying attention to and, um, you know, put that capital where entrepreneurs who might have a hard time raising from mainstream VCs, uh, like if I can find those, then I feel even better about that. Mm. Um, in your, from your perspective, your, from your position, because you know, you have a, I guess, uh, you have a pretty good overview, like what's going on in the space um, in terms of development and product development and, you know, um, what do you think is missing um, in terms of adoption process like not only the users you know the normal average people but in terms of i'm just going to be specific like merchants you know businesses education tutorials like breaking things down simplifying the process yeah um it's funny there are so many different facets of bitcoin adoption that there are ways to make progress on any of those fronts that are useful and valuable. I think there's you've been a lot of good progress on institutional on ramps, for example, with like backed and fidelity and all of that. And although that's certain, you know, it's like less cypherpunk anarcho capitalist that's a little more mainstream, I think that's really important. Like the more fiat money that flows into Bitcoin is better for everyone who wants to see Bitcoin succeed. And the opinions on that can get rather nuanced when it comes to things like KYC and regulation. Um, but broadly speaking, I think the more dollars that flow into Bitcoin, the more fiat that gets over to the Bitcoin side, the better for the world and for the future. Um, so in terms of areas that I want to see more progress on, I, you know, I've been impressed with the recent progress on CoinJoin and privacy technology. Samurai has been doing a lot of that. So the fact that CoinJoin is now available on just mobile devices with Samurai on Android is really cool. Making it, like making that more accessible, democratizing that privacy technology is good. Um, an area that I don't see a lot of people paying attention to that I do think is going to be a really big deal is micropayments. And perhaps the Lightning Network ends up being the, the kind of de facto layer for that. It seems very promising so far. But a lot of that fell into the background in 2016, 2017, because on-chain fees went up a lot. And some of the companies that were trying things like that at the time uh, just didn't have much success. They had, they had a rough time of it because they were kind of trying to do things on-chain. And so now that we've got another layer of infrastructure like Lightning, those low latency, virtually free transactions become much more practical to do. And that, uh, like, I guess I get a lot more excited about the stuff that 
money can't do. Like when it comes to the Lightning Network and Bitcoin in general, I think people tend to say, oh, money does this today. Like I pay for coffee using my money, using my cash. And so in the future, when Bitcoin is money, Bitcoin's going to be the way that I do that. And yes, I hope and believe that's the case. But there is something that money can't do today for reasons that are purely technological limitations. Like it's not been possible to send half of a penny around the world to someone in another country before. Mm -hmm. We just haven't had the infrastructure, right? With these proprietary centralized systems like PayPal and banks and the SWIFT system, it would just get eaten away by fees. It's impractical. And so a lot of the ways that the internet is architected today is the result of that. Um, we have this really complex web of advertisers and middlemen so that your time like when you watch a YouTube video, for example, if YouTube shows you ads, that is this indirect result of them not being able to monetize directly, not having some mechanism for payment, you know, uh, or if there is, it has to be this bit like heavyweight, maybe monthly subscription model with a fixed amount. I think now that we have a protocol for money like Bitcoin and technologies that seem promising like lightning, then there could be this future in which the content producers are just able to monetize very directly with the consumers online. And that could be in the form of getting paid in sats for uploading, like seeding a torrent file and just being compensated per megabyte by anybody else who wants to download that from you to incentivize file sharing so it's less altruistic. Um, YouTube, for example, uh, APIs. So if developers are making new APIs uh, for web services, being able to charge for an API to return a result, that's game changing in my opinion. That could revolutionize how the whole internet looks. And I think it'd be a lot better internet. You know, probably wouldn't be perfect, but it would be a big improvement once we have that ability to weave economics into the protocol directly. Mm, so that's, it's kind of a nascent area, yeah, but, um, but I'm excited to, I don't see much focus yet on that. I think it did kind of fall into the background, unfortunately, when on-chain fees rose. And so I'm hopeful that we'll see a lot more focus on that in the coming areas, both from companies building on it. Lightning Labs has been doing what seems like great work in building the foundations there. And hopefully capital and companies and ideas will just start to flourish. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you on that. And you know, I mean, um, I, I need to be honest sometimes with myself. I mean, it's, it's hard to spoon feed like force spoon feed people you know if people are not ready yet they're not ready yet but i guess there is a process this is why i'm looking forward to whatever that is, you know strike or other uh you know platforms which already exist but not maybe in europe or european union centrally like um what is it called like uh, Azt aztec and with the blue wallet where Azteca. where the exactly where the vendors can just for the for the sake of profit making profits, you know, they, they don't even need to think about Bitcoin. And I think maybe that is part, part of the process to not even, you know, uh, try to make the user, the customer or, you know, the merchant, the vendors even think about it, <laughs> just use yeah. it. And eventually they'll just, you know, uh, they'll just uh, uh, in a very charming way, uh, get into the rabbit hole of Bitcoin. What's your take on that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think you'll you'll see a lot of statements around Twitter that are very extreme and very binary along the lines of, if you're not running a Bitcoin full node, then you are not using Bitcoin. And I appreciate the, the spirit behind what I think people are saying with that. Like, I agree, decentralization is important. The more nodes we have, the, the better. Um, but realistically, there is, I hope, this future in which people are using Bitcoin every day and they have no idea how it works under the hood, or um, they, they don't need to understand the gory details in the same way that my mom sends email every day and she doesn't run her own SMTP server or her own email server. She doesn't understand TCP IP, but we've just built these layers of software that are user friendly enough to enable her to benefit from that technology. And I think the same is gonna be true of Bitcoin. We'll be sent exchanging value every day, probably, many more exchanges of value than we could even comprehend doing right now because it'll be programmatic and automated to a larger extent. And now that we have this protocol for money, that becomes feasible. Um, I used to work at, uh, I did a brief stint at a fintech company, financial tech, kind of in the, the mainstream banking and investment sector. 
And I remember being struck by how many software engineers it took to just make sure that money got from point A to point B. Like you, you know, you have this database that says how many dollars you have and your customers have, and you interface with all these banks. And it's just these disparate systems, like these databases that are everywhere and no overarching protocol to really control it. And you just have like doing settlement, you have to make sure that the numbers are right. If you, you didn't accidentally, you know, create dollars or fail to, to kind of uh, do some corresponding update. And there were rooms of people just dedicated to solving that problem. And in a future in which Bitcoin is money, that goes away, right? It's like each company doesn't have to do that, doesn't have to reinvent money transmission. Um, there's a protocol for it. And so just like internet companies today don't have to do their own information transfer protocol, they can use TCP IP um, in the future, they won't have to worry about value transfer protocols. There will just be Bitcoin and maybe Lightning Network. Um, and going back to your uh, to your conviction, um, I share the same conviction with you. I, I mean, there is no other choice. Bitcoin needs to become the global reserve currency settlement layer, meter exchange, unit account, and of course store of value. Um, with all the with all the things going on right now, with all these uh, really crazy things going on right now. Um, do you see that, uh, I mean, as sad as it is, uh, you know, you know got to be I mean, reflecting upon this, but um, do you see the, the conditions mature enough to, you know, sort of to, to, to uh, uh, speed up this, this monetary evolution? Yes, I do. Um, I think it's an, um, I want to be careful with the word I choose, you know, you, because it is a very difficult situation globally that a lot of people are in right now. And that's sad and unfortunate. Um, and I think a lot of it, the, the very root cause when you connect enough dots is the money. Um, this system of fiat money and central banking has been quietly stealing value from individuals around the world. And so there are much, you know, some very specific causes for some very specific events, kind of many layers above that. But often if you trace it back, there is this frustration that maybe people experience and they don't even realize it's happening. You know, the system is quite complicated. And so it's, uh, it's not uncommon for people to feel just angry and not be able to really articulate why. They just feel like the system is against them and it gets harder and harder to save and to progress in society even though they have to work harder and harder so that is uh that yeah i think that the backdrop for this macro environment we have right now a lot of people are waking up to it my friends in you know small rural towns in the u.s where i grew up who are still some of my best friends today, they don't care about Bitcoin and they don't have much interest in economics particularly, but they have started referring to dollars as funny money. And it's kind of, it's joking, you know, and it's tongue in cheek, but they'll, you know, they're starting to joke about, hey, they, you know, if they can just make trillions, why do we pay taxes for things? Why can't yeah. they just print money to do whatever they want? And so finally, thanks largely to the internet and these ways to communicate that we've never had before and that weren't even as popular in the former recession, we've we've got the ability to kind of help people understand what's going on more and help them opt out into this new potentially bitcoin based future and it's a difficult balance because there are very sad events that you you know do warrant specific kind of attention and you don't want to seem insensitive to those by saying oh just you know buy bitcoin and that'll fix your problem like life will be great if you just buy bitcoin um so i i try to balance sensitivity towards specific improvements in society that are very important but also hopefully remembering at some point to zoom out and think in very long-term macro terms what is under all of this what's at the root and that is where i think bitcoin strikes at the root and the more people that we can get to opt into bitcoin the more of a peaceful future we have um, with greater opportunity for, for everyone, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. Um, you call yourself um, on Twitter um, anarcho-capitalist. So if we want to go to the essence of, you know, because I think most people just don't, 
they don't really understand. Uh, I mean, it is difficult to understand the, the matrix of where we are, the system, you know, with the self-appointed, unaccountable, criminally immune entities such as the central banks and monopolies and, you know, oligarchies, whatever you would call it. So this separation, this, this really urgently overdue separation of money and state government and, you know, this freedom from the, from the central, do you think people are waking up to that? I think so, and I hope so. Um, it's funny you mention the ANCAP or anarcho-capitalist. That's a pretty recent addition to my Twitter bio, and it's something that I used to not be very comfortable talking about publicly because I was worried that it was this term that would just get you put into mm -hmm. a bucket of, oh, people who can't be taken seriously, right? Um, it seems very extreme, and especially back when I was working in Silicon Valley, kind of full-time job, big tech enterprise, uh, I remember thinking if I'm intellectually honest about this with people I work with, then it would limit my career advancement opportunity. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. I, I, I don't believe that anarchism and anarcho-capitalism is this image a lot of people jump to of people in masks throwing bombs and Molotov cocktails and just chaos everywhere. Um, it's, it's not that, but it, yeah, a lot of people think that it's that. And so in order to uh, help people understand what it is, I've tried to just be more comfortable being public about uh, believing that that's a better future. It's not violent. I think central banking is violent and nation states are only sustained because they have a monopoly on violence. And I think that's evil and unfortunate. And in the past, it was almost not even worth saying that you were an ANCAP because even if you could convince someone that anarcho-capitalism would lead to a better future, a more peaceful future, it was still impractical to achieve. Before discovering Bitcoin, I very I remember vividly thinking, I you know don't even bother. I'll just call myself kind of a libertarian and you know try to change things through the mainstream system as much as I can. Um, but it's not worth going further than that because it's completely impractical. So that whole discussion is moot. And now that Bitcoin exists, I, I don't believe that anymore. I think that future is very possible. I think Bitcoin can help us usher in an era of more of a voluntary, peaceful, opt-in society. And it doesn't mean no rules. Uh, it doesn't mean a lot of the things that the government does today don't happen. It just means that they're supplied in more voluntary private market ways. Um, so I think uh, at a very high level, I would just like to see less big centralized government and more freedom, more individual liberty. Uh, I think that would give us this future of a lot more optionality and put the incentives in a better place. So you might get a lot smaller countries, maybe the 50 United States today each become separate countries. Um, maybe the maybe it's even smaller than that more maybe it's like a city-state model and even citadels to use you know the i was just gonna ask you about there. that a wonderful that you brought it up because <laughs> i just read the book of uh, yeah. he was actually in steven levera's uh, podcast show uh, recently uh tito scable um he's i i believe he's originally from germany but i read it in german because the book is in german and english uh free private cities and I thought, God, you know, if, if we just, because I call myself a total connector. So I was just thinking if all these entrepreneurs, these really, you know, beautiful minds and, and visionaries and, and investors or angel investors like yourself uh, come together, uh, do you see a lack of, of structural, efficient, more efficient, more inter interconcerted communication? Like when it comes to implementation manifestation of all these visions we're talking about? I think technology, like platforms such as Twitter, as a very specific example, have been, have made futures like this more realistic and have made me more optimistic about the future. So in the past, even if there would have been people who believed it, like the same number of, say, anarcho-capitalists or libertarians in the world, it would have been a lot more difficult to coordinate or even to feel good about the potential for the future by realizing that other people have this shared vision because in the past the flow of information was so tightly controlled by the 
these centralized channels, right? Big television stations or radio stations before that even. And so now that we've got Twitter and anybody can kind of be a reporter or at least have an online presence and connect individual to individual with others, then you can, you can just kind of build that community virtually and uh, online in the cloud, so to speak. And that makes it easier to manifest that in the physical world, to coordinate among individuals and potentially manifest that in the physical world in some way. And maybe that literally does manifest as this, you know, citadel, um, physical region, city state in, uh, you know, Wyoming, uh, Austin, yeah. Texas seems to have a pretty good lead on, uh, on Bitcoin and citadel expertise. So, uh, jealous of that. You're almost reading my thought because I was just, if... I was just going to bring up Wyoming, you know, <laughs> when is Wyoming going to secede from the United States? It's always my question, right. but, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, there is no other option. Do we have, I mean, still realistically, is there any option? Because it's besides just, because most people I think are in this attitude or because of this indoctrination, like wait for the permission, you know, from the state, from the government, from whoever authoritarian control. I think that we have no other choice than to, uh, you know, form a breakaway civilization within a self uh, really organized private contractually, whatever you want to call it, you know, society, citadel city, free private city, What's your vision on that? I mean, is there is there any other choice we have? I I agree. Like I I hope and believe that we'll see something like actual citadels in the future. But I think that we can create a better world and kind of have a digital version of that. We can secede in place, so to speak. So with the internet and with now digital money, we can kind of secede and take power away from the state and reclaim control over our sovereignty without needing to do so in a geographical way. And that is super powerful. I think that is absolutely game changing because the state does have a monopoly on violence, right? Their, their old throw people in cages for disobeying the laws trick is going to remain effective for quite a while. <laughs> and so, so I think that uh, they could, you know, they could target people in the same geography very easily, or they could exert leverage or pressure over them very easily. But the fact that we can all connect through these social media platforms and, uh, you know, even build such platforms in a more decentralized way going forward, hopefully, that just makes our ability to coordinate more robust. It lets us exchange value more easily. And that over time chips away at the state's power to even enforce their violence on monopoly. So every, their monopoly on violence, sorry. Uh, so every individual who buys Bitcoin and controls their own keys, that sounds small, right? It kind of sounds trivial, but that steals power from the state. That makes it so that their value can no longer be debased via inflation. They've opted out of the inflation tax. And the senior rush, that right? is, uh, out of the rent-seeking, you know, tax in, in theft system. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, it, it, absolutely, yes. And, and that's one point. Like, uh, I think there's a lot of emphasis on capital gains taxes and sales taxes and these taxes that are associated with exchanging value. And those are very real and they exist and they're important to, to think about. But a tax that is particularly sinister because not many people even are aware that they're paying it and it's not really called a tax is the inflation tax, right? People, have, especially a lot of people in the middle class have savings that they work very hard for and they put them in a bank account. They have dollars in a bank account or fiat in a bank account. And over time, the government prints more of that money and devalues their savings and that they won't tell you it's a tax and they hide it behind a very complex web of terminology designed to intimidate you and make you afraid to ask questions about it. So terms like quantitative easing um, and, and all that. But ultimately, it does boil down to inflating the supply of money. And Bitcoin lets you opt out of that. And it's legal. You Even as simple as just buying and holding Bitcoin, then your value that you created is stored in Bitcoin and not being debased. And how we can argue all day about like how effective that is and how much power it takes away, but it's non-zero. It's something and it's legal. And so that is like a very 
clear and powerful way to begin. And, uh, you know, and then beyond that, I think that that gives us this check on state power. So it forces them to ask us if they want to do things. And that's, it's funny, like how simple and, you know, uh, of a concept that seems like, but there's a lot of stuff right now that just happens because the state can fund it using money that's stolen in these non-obvious ways. So if they want to go to war, if they want to fight a decade long war in the Middle East, and they need trillions of dollars to fund it, then if people have their wealth in Bitcoin, the state would have to convince them to hand over their money. What a novel concept, right? Having to actually ask if you want to do something. Uh, and I think a lot of the world's biggest evils are enabled by the fact that they don't have to ask. They don't have to tell people, oh, that'll be you know, $75,000 per household if we wanna go fight a war in Iraq or in Afghanistan. Um, and maybe some people would pay that. You know, everyone can use their money for whatever they want for it. And even if you don't pass any judgment on that, but some people might not. And it needs to at least be explicit. It needs to be a conversation. And today it's not, and in a Bitcoin future it would be. And I think that's important. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's a peaceful, it's a, it's a money, it's a technology that actually uh, sets the stage or, or creates the conditions, right? The parameters for, for, a, for a more peaceful, at least, um, um, civilization, human civilization. Um, do you see the central banks? I mean, if, if you know, if the, this this centralized structures would it be you know the governments nation state the collusion central banks you know achieve to come out with uh you know the cbdc the central bank digital currency and banning cash do you do you foresee that in the foreseeable future i do think central banks will try to create their own digital currencies we're already seeing rumblings of china and russia trying similar concepts I don't think they'll present a threat to Bitcoin ultimately. They, it'll be you know a battle for sure, and the the state has a lot of money and a lot of resources. So if people thought that 2017 was frustrating when we had a lot of rich companies creating altcoins to try to convince people that they're the next Bitcoin and effectively scam people out of their money, then it will be a whole different level when it is states and central banks trying to do that. So I absolutely think that's going to occur. But ultimately, the value proposition of Bitcoin is that it's not centralized. And so it's got this inherent advantage that hopefully will become increasingly clear to people is beneficial and encourage people to opt into it instead. And once the value is in Bitcoin and it can't be forcibly easily extracted, especially at scale and en masse, um, then it gives a lot more leverage to the individuals. Um, that yeah, that whole, the concept of um, altcoins and central banks, it's like it kind of just levels up, right? We start at the company scale in 2017, ICOs and altcoins, and everyone will try to compete in this new realm of digital money. But it's hard to overcome the network effects of Bitcoin. And especially the the founding of Bitcoin, like a lot of people measure decentralization in terms of just servers on the network, right? And so they will naively think that, oh, if some uh, government with more resources can spin up more servers, then maybe they can make something more decentralized. But server infrastructure is only one aspect of decentralization and social decentralization is very important. Um, de like not having a hierarchy and a leadership is very important. So the fact that Satoshi is anonymous and we don't know who he or she or they is, makes Bitcoin immune to all kinds of social attack vectors that many people don't appreciate. The, we, if we knew who Satoshi were, then there would be entities out there right now going through his entire past, her entire past, getting every detail about everything controversial they've ever done, every opinion they've ever had, and trying to divide people over that. And the fact that they can't is important and powerful and that uh, helps save a lot of energy that would be spent on defending bitcoin or explaining why it's the idea that's important and not the founder or the creator totally agree with you and you after 11 years as i always say you know the cat is out of the back pandora's box been opened and it's too late like you know you, you mentioned the network effect the uh, the 
uh, the even the adoption rate. I mean, it's just uh, even if we can't like specify how many millions of people within 30, 50, or 70 million people are really sitting on hodling on Bitcoin, it doesn't really matter. But I guess we will um, eventually see the the network effect when it reaches the critical adoption rate, whether it be half a billion people or uh, whatever that is, whatever that triggers the this exponential process. Yeah, and I get more optimistic when I think about the path forward, when I remind myself that these entities that I'm concerned about, you know, if we're worried about regulators or governments reacting violently against Bitcoin, it's important to prepare against that. And we don't want to be dependent on them embracing it, but it would be lovely if they peacefully embraced it. <laughs> um, and if they, w when you frame it as, oh, the, you know, the CIA, the NSA, the central banks, then these entities seem very anti-Bitcoin and it becomes very realistic psychologically to think they would attack Bitcoin. But it's also important to remember that those are just collections of individuals. All these agencies, governments in general, are just collections of individuals. And when you, when you analyze it through that lens, I get a lot more optimistic about the future. Because the game theory is such that if you have these smart people in these organizations who find Bitcoin, or maybe they're even tasked with, hey, go and figure out if this Bitcoin thing is a threat and figure out how to stop it, then in the process of doing that, they'll either not think it's a threat, in which case they probably don't understand it, and so they're not worth worrying about anyway. Or if they do understand it, their individual incentive is pretty powerful to buy some Bitcoin and yeah. to get some so skin, get in, the skin in the game for themselves, exactly. yeah. maybe even as a hedge. Yeah, yeah. And, and then at that point, you know, it's almost like they kind of become infected with the mind virus, so to speak, and, uh, and that just adds to the network effect of the overall system. And, you know, um, I mean, let's be honest, I mean, it's nothing is black and white, right? I mean, it just recently this uh, pretty prominent economist who studied the Bank of Japan, which is named Richard Werner, said, um, um, and I, you know, and I, and I said, you know, he might uh, embarrass himself with this discussion because he said sort of, oh, the CIA is behind Bitcoin. And even, and I said, even if there were, if there are people or once, uh, where people who came out of the three-letter organization, whether it be the NSA, CIA, you know, maybe they defected. Maybe, maybe, maybe these were exactly those people who 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 had a you know a principle of ethos of, of a vision, you know, something of a vision, and wanted to do to contribute something. And they have you know their own families, their children, and they want to have you know brighter future. So maybe it's important to understand there is no black and white. There is this gray zone where people you know like you and I. Uh, want to really uh, contribute something, you know, to humanity or to the children or whatever, to the future of our human civilization. Um, so, yeah, a little self-reflection. Yeah, I, I agree very much. Um, it, I think if some organization released Bitcoin with the intent of, um, you know, increasing the power of the nation state, then I think they made a big mistake. <laughs> and, yeah. I think that, and I think that it's very likely, as you described, that maybe if, if it did come out of some organization like that, maybe it was just individuals who saw the betterment that it could bring to society at large and made an, in a decision at their level to release it. I don't know. The, the origin story of Bitcoin is completely fascinating to me. It's yeah. like the closest thing to a movie script that we have in real life. Yeah, right? totally. Yeah, it could have been a cryptographer, you know, like within those uh, compartmentalized structures. But it doesn't matter. So, um, so Stephen, where do you? Uh, what 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 can we do? You know, I mean, as as uh, can, is there anything we can do more efficiently in communication, education wise, in tutorial wise, or sharing knowledge, inspiring? Is there anything, uh, do you have any ideas? I mean, how we can do this, you know, better, uh, this whole process? Yeah, I, I, I'm really optimistic because I was in Bitcoin in 2013. That's about when I started looking into it and, uh, you know, getting really involved in early 2014. And back then it was so much harder to learn about Bitcoin and why it was important all the resources were scattered around and there were brilliant, you know, engineers in it, but some material was on Reddit posts somewhere. And so 
the things that you're doing as an example and the, there's more podcasting in the space there's more educational material that's aggregated in useful places um one of my favorite resources is bitcoin-only.com um that's a collection by the pseudonymous uh, 6102. individual 6102 bitcoin yeah. and i think yeah yeah the the more content that we have like that the easier it is to get going and the more people who have been in this space for a while can accelerate the adoption by others and kind of help them avoid the pitfalls that we had to experience along the way. So I had a long journey through cryptocurrencies and altcoins and, you know, owned a lot of those and thought some of those were the future uh, at one point many years ago. And I ultimately did a 180 on that and came back to believing that Bitcoin is the future and I don't see any promise yet in altcoins. I, I try to keep an open mind. Um, but now when I onboard people into Bitcoin, I can much more succinctly give them that why behind that and help kind of fast track them to the right places, appointing so them like companies like Swan Bitcoin, um, which you know I'm an investor in, but they are an on-ramp that doesn't even offer altcoins. They're Bitcoin only, and they only let you buy. They only let you currently go from fiat to Bitcoin. You can't even go from you know Bitcoin back to fiat. And the existence of that infrastructure in those companies is just powerful. And we have this like virtuous cycle going now, right, of people who uh, have experienced that, and so they help other people avoid that, and then other then then those people will help others on board. Um, so I'm impressed with the podcast material, the educational material that's evolved and the improvements in on-ramps overall. Um, I would say, yeah, I, I think that perspective of just seeing how far it's come has made me pretty happy with and even more optimistic about the future. Fascinating. Yeah. No, I think I really, I really uh, a huge fan of, of Swan Bitcoin because, you know, you, you mentioned the word, uh, I think, pre prepare ones or, or preparation. I think preparation is everything. So uh, sometimes I have this feeling that we are racing against a real, you know, horrendous machinery out there with, you know, uh, 1984 Orwellian technocratic surveillance programs and and I mean it's just crazy what's going on it's just un unbelievable beyond description so this is sometimes where I'm like maybe we should hurry up a little bit you know yeah, yeah. you know people should huddle and you know auto accumulate auto DCA everything but at the same time like maybe we should prepare just just for for a transitional preparation period you know just prepare the merchants the small business owners the merchants and you know and get them really either face to face tutorials you know help them because there there are so many pitfalls and so many trial and errors i went through it myself i it took me more than a week to set up my 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 note you know and connect all the applications there you know it's overwhelming and i talk to people and they say you know they talk they, they tell me hey i would love you know i would love to offer my customers i would even give them a discount but it just this is not an easy process and you know they can't even handle the hardware wallet so let alone you know yeah. doing this all this i mean i'm a huge fan of btcp server for example so i'm like if we could just you know structurally maybe form a, a task force special task force teams in different continents countries language wise and help these people like you know this is where i'm going with this you know yeah, I agree. Um, the brick and mortar businesses or and merchants around the world, um, preparing them more for a Bitcoin based future is really important. I run a meetup group in Southern California called the Orange County Bitcoin oh, Network. Can. And My family lives there. That we're... <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, that's where I'm at. Um, so if they ever want to come to a meetup, uh, they are more than welcome. Um, so we're, a big focus of ours is increasingly on just local merchants. And uh, I think for people who are in Bitcoin and experienced in Bitcoin and maybe listening to this podcast, help position yourself to kind of be maybe the, the Bitcoiner for your region or even just for your social circle, for your family and your trusted friends. I don't think it's realistic to expect everyone in the future to run a Bitcoin full node, but I want to see as many people as possible run one. So if, you know, th there may be this in between where these small trusted groups, family and friends have someone in there who's the Bitcoin person and that person run full node is 
the expert on what wallets to use and all the trade-offs and can can kind of help guide that circle towards towards that direction and meetup groups or some geographic based entity that can help almost do the equivalent for merchants can be really important and really useful so i think it's balancing that that realism of like even if we don't expect everyone to run a full node it's important not to get lazy and the more that you can learn about it as a bitcoiner the more that you can help the network help increase the value of of bitcoin even indirectly by just making sure the network's resilient and more distributed so using tor running a full node um, doing coin joins helping make like, normalizing coin join and privacy so that it's no longer weird it's just this default it's expected we should be private things should be fungible um, the more of that the better yeah and samurai wallet is doing a really great job i'm a huge fan because they they sort of uh you know uh transform this into a, by, by default uh you know uh wallets where you can spend directly out of your whirlpool uh you know coin joint out of your whirlpool so it's it's great it's just uh it's 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 simplified the process yeah so uh steve thank you so yeah. much i really uh, enjoyed our talk is there anything like final thoughts or where do you want to direct my listeners viewers to uh, let's see. I'm on Twitter. That's where I am most active online. Um, Twitter.com slash S then C and appreciate the opportunity to be on here. If there are any entrepreneurs out there that are building on Bitcoin or towards a future like this. And, mm -hmm. uh, basically if you're on a mission to take power away from big governments, and give it back to people, then I would love to talk to you. Even if I'm not investing directly, I would love to just help um in whatever way i can with things like that and uh if you're in southern california come to the orange county bitcoin network yeah, and thank thank you for uh this opportunity and for doing podcasts like this i think this is for the space yeah keep up your great work steve i'm a huge fan of yours <laughs> thank you so much all right uh, likewise appreciate it bye bye All right, that was awesome. I uh, really enjoyed my talk with Stephen Cole. Uh, he's an anarcho capitalist, real true Bitcoiner, and he understands you know, the essence, the power, the, the, the vision behind Bitcoin, and the angel investor. Invested in so many you know, ethical and really sustainable projects, such as, again, Samurai Wallet, uh, Casa Hodl, um, and, and a Swan Bitcoin with the Auto DCA program only Bitcoin. So yeah, let me know what you think. Please like it, retweet, share. If you haven't subscribed yet to my channel, to my YouTube channel or to my you know different uh, podcast platforms, please do now. We really appreciate any positive review, comments, like, uh, retweet, share, whatever. And my email address is hello at the totalconnector.com. My email address um, and my website is the totalconnector.com or kevandavani.com slash podcast. And you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, social, all kinds of social media, Telegram, Instagram, and what have you. Thank you so much again for your support, for listening, and I'll see you soon again. Bye.